Thank you, Brother Bill. Very kind of you to have those remembrances. I remember 17 years ago attending the Refreshing Waters renewal. And the feeling at that time, I was really too young to be on the program. Now there's been a vote taken that I'm too old. <laughs> so, uh, wonderful 17 years. I, I feel like they put me on after Jason to show you plan B of what not to be in a preacher. So <laughs> God bless you, Jason. That was wonderful. Around 28 years ago, uh, I was uh, with a evangelist friend of mine rummaging around Israel, wandered up on the Sea of Galilee, needed to spend the night and checked in. Very nice hotel. I needed some razor blades and they had a little shop off the lobby there and I wandered in and took care of my business but I always look at book racks, you know, see the titles of the books. One grabbed my attention very quickly, entitled, God was here, but he didn't stay very long. I scratched my head and I said, praise God, he stayed long enough to take care of what he intended to do. Amen. Now my job tonight is to tell you why he come, even if he didn't stay very long. By the way, I didn't read the book. I had one that already told me, so <laughs> I didn't see any reason to buy that one. So I want to read to you tonight from Isaiah. 49th chapter, the third verse, but I'll read the first three verses here. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shot of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will show my glory. Now, of course, don't be distracted by calling Jesus here Israel. After all, Israel means he will rule as God. <laughs> you might as well call Jesus Israel. That's a good name for him. I've heard his name several. This one mentioned his name was called David. Of course, he called the root of Jesse. We're talking about Jesus here. Now, I know we're talking about Jesus by the context. On down a little bit further, it says, God was going to have him restore the house of Israel and the house of Jacob. <laughs> I find this amazing about God as he talked to Jesus. <laughs> he says, you know, it's just too small a thing for you to be my servant and restore the tribes of Jacob, bring back those of Israel I've kept. That's, that's too little a job for you. I'll also make you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Of course, we're talking about Jesus. This, uh, this same context goes all the way into the 52nd, 53rd chapter of the suffering servant. We all know Jesus. We're talking about the same Jesus here. But I'll tell you, before he could be a suffering servant, he was a servant to display the glory of God first. As a matter of fact, 
becoming a suffering servant was displaying the glory of God. Amen. And so we have here announced by God himself that he was turning over his glory to be displayed by his son Jesus Christ. Now, the question is, is did he fulfill that promise? Now, at the last, and I might as well just get this out right now, God's glory is what God has revealed of himself. That means unless you have a revelation of God, you don't know anything about his glory. Unless you have received and know God, you don't know anything about his glory. Unless you have the light shined upon God, you don't know anything about his glory. It's obscured. If you can't hear God, you don't know anything about his glory. If you can't draw near to God, you'll never know anything about his glory. Until you are raised up, set with Jesus in heavenly places, you don't know anything about the glory of God. And in this one powerful assertion, God through Isaiah announces, Jesus, you are my servant in whom I will display my glory. Now, Paul to the Corinthians, he just calls him the Lord of glory. Now, what that means is, this may be his Texas language, but I think you can understand it. Jesus is in charge. He is the boss of revealing God. He is in charge of revealing God. If you don't have Jesus and listen to him, you'll never know anything about God, or certainly not much, not enough to say the least. He is in charge of revealing God. Now, glory then is the expose of the divine nature. Uh, even more succinctly, glory is the revelation of God. Now, it's not a revelation by God. It's a revelation of God himself. Now, that, that's glory. Now, I don't understand everything there is to know about this third verse. I'm confident of that. But I am more confident that I do understand that glory is the revelation of God. Now, if it's more than that, wonderful. But it's at least that. Now, glory is a revelation of God, and the revelation of God is Jesus Christ. And so, here, now let's see if Jesus understood that. <laughs> well, you know, I'm joking. But Jesus certainly claimed to be this servant, and I don't want you to forget that. He was this servant to reveal God or display his glory. Now, of course, there's been a couple of times uh, an arresting oracle by Balaam has been mentioned this week part that I was concerned with, the star will come out of Jacob, you know, to Balaam, it, and it wasn't here, and I can't quite see it now, but uh, it's, it's going to happen. The star will come out. Well, we began writing Matthew, not far into it. The star rose, and a wise man, <laughs> see, saw it. There's a revelation. He saw it. And you're going to note through here when we're going to use a lot of uh, words that mean reveal. I saw something, the light was turned on it, etc. Now, I know that was the glory of God because of the result of what happened to those wise men. The Bible said when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. <laughs> there is not a prayer's chance of you getting a revelation from God that will not make you joyful. They're not a person. It is all legitimate joy is coming from a revelation of God, of God himself. And the more you see, the more joy you're going to have. And I'll just get this out of the way now. I'll keep coming back to it. 
think how much of him you're going to see in heaven. <laughs> so how much joy are you going to have? <laughs> it's, it's just endless. It's going to take an eternity, which, of course, means it'll never end for you folks in Indiana. Now, the question is, is the day dawned and the morning star risen in your heart? Now, let's consider the baptism of Jesus. Here was God on earth. Here was the Lamb of God. There's the line to be baptized for the remission of sins. And he got in the line. Sin bearer was with man for all the men to see. What's he doing in line? I didn't think he was a sinner. Like Jesus was already beginning to take the sins of the world on him. Now, that's just the way I think about that. But he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Coming up from those baptismal waters, and this has been mentioned, in fact, all my scriptures have been mentioned this way. That's okay. At that moment, heaven was opened. Now, is that not revealing God when you open heaven? You're beginning to see God. And is Jesus it caused? That's my point. He's the servant to reveal God. Now, Matthew 4. This is uh, uh, context has been covered somewhat. Jesus repulsed the devil. Then he went into the area of Galilee, where God was there, but he didn't stay long, according to the book. And here's what happened when Jesus passed by. People living in darkness, no glory there, nothing been revealed to them, <laughs> have seen a great light. Uh, revelations coming. Jesus, see, passed by. In the land of the shadow of death, a light is dawned. That light, of course, is revealing God's glory. Now, what was the conclusion, verse 17 of, of, of that context? From that time on, the kingdom of heaven is near. There, there you are. We're getting a revelation here. It's not way off. Brother Jason said, planted the flag right there. Yeah, it's near. Now, obviously, the Gospel of John records the most superlative language of Jesus fulfilling Isaiah 49.3. I'd like to cover a few of those with you. First chapter of John. The word Jesus became flesh, lived for a while among us. The word became flesh. Now the word, words are to reveal. The word became flesh. <laughs> now we, we can hear him. Uh, he and what's he going to, he's going to reveal God. That, that was the message, that was his job, to reveal God. He didn't have an agenda of his own. Amen. That's the one thing I started giggy about, Jason, is, is, is he preached his own, no, he preached what he heard from God. So of course, you agreed with that, and there wasn't any need of saying anything. And what does the scripture say there? We have seen his glory. Well, well, of course, you see in both the revelation of Jesus, but you're also seeing the revelation of God through Jesus. We have seen his glory of the one and only Son, but he came from the Father. Where did he get to his glory? He got it, of course, from the Father. Full of grace and truth. Now, you know, to me, just out working at the barn, I call that my coin of glory. Coins already always got two sides here. Kind of look at one side and I see grace and look at the other side and see truth. Or look at one side and see mercy and the other side and see judgment. Or, you, you know, we could do several of those. It, it's just for my sake. If there's two great pillars that uphold the throne of God, Bill, that we were talking about, you talked about a little earlier there, in him, Jesus, was life. Now, life is a glory of God. 
but in Jesus was life. <laughs> See, he's showing the world here. And that life was the light. Light. I'm shedding light on this, says Jesus. It was a light of men. No one has seen God. Now, this is all just in the first chapter, John. No one has seen God, but God the Son has made him known, revealed him, thus glory. Later in that same, of course, that's a long chapter, Jesus promised Nathaniel, who already believed Jesus was the Son of God and King of Israel, and because of that, he says, Nathaniel, you're going to see heaven open. You're going to have a revelation here. Can you imagine seeing heaven open? What it'll do to you? I'll tell you in a few minutes. So because of his Nathaniel's faith in Jesus, Jesus was going to show him God, thus his glory. Amen. Now, John the Baptist is speaking of Jesus over in the third chapter of John. He says, now the one who comes from heaven, of course he's above all, but he testifies to what he has seen and heard. And what he'd seen and heard was from God. He's testifying of God because he'd seen and heard it. Now the man who accepts this testimony of Jesus has certified that God is truthful. There's half of my glory right there, you know, on my, on my coin. You know, one side's grace, the other side's grace. Has certified that God is truthful when you accept that testimony of Jesus. He's revealing God. Now in John the fifth chapter, Jesus speaks. He says, now what the Father does, by the way, what the Father does is glory. The Son also does. <laughs> there he is. He's revealing it. I can see what the Son does. Now I know what the Father's doing. So by that I know who God is. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives him life, Put in my words, what? Put, put words in Jesus' mouth. Well, I can do that, Jesus said. Even so the Son. For as the Father has life, author of life in himself, so he's granted that to the Son. So as you see the Son, he will show you God. Well, obviously, we believe that God created this. Of course, he did create all world through the sun and to a limited degree even that we know that testifies of his glory in other words you can learn a little bit about God observing the universe uh -huh. I know he's powerful but I don't know he's a God of love don't know he's a God of mercy don't know he's a God of justice <laughs> I just know Boy, he's something. He can create all of this. But as a creator, he put himself above all of that. Right. And uh, he's not subject to its laws, time, space, gravity. It just boggles my mind to live outside of time. But I'm wanting to experience it. So Jesus, as a man, on occasion, had these same attributes when it was keeping with the Father's work. Well, he could just raise the dead, heal the sick, walk on water, feed the masses with precious little, pass through the mob, as is mentioned today, like they couldn't lay a hand on him. Giving life is a glory of God because it reveals something about it. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life. I am that bread. I am come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now the will of God. You know, you surely understand his will is part of his glory. It, because it reveals his mind, his uh, desires. Here's what Jesus says. I've come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. There it is. 
The judgments of God are his glory. Because when you start judging someone, you're showing who you are. So the judgments of God are certainly showing who he is. And here's, where, here's what Jesus says. Now, if I do judge, <laughs> my decisions are right because I'm not alone. I'm with the Father. He sent me as a servant to display his glory, I might say. Knowing God is glory. Just by simple definition, if nothing else, knowing God is glory. So Jesus said, why, if you knew me, you know the Father. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. What God says is glory. Can you imagine God saying something that's not glory? It is glory because it's true and it reveals who God is when he speaks. Amen. Hear Jesus. Now what I heard from the Father, I tell the world. <laughs> there it is. There's his glory on display. What pleases God is his glory. Here's Jesus. I always do what pleases him. Amen. See, getting close to God is Lord, I'm telling you what I've seen in the Father's presence, says Jesus. Obviously, truth is, you know, half of my glory, corn. Jesus was a man who told the truth that he heard from God. Of course, you comment on that. There is no truth but from for I gave them the words you gave me as he spoke to his father. Remember Lazarus' death and resurrection. Said twice that was for God's glory. In other words, you're going to reveal something about God here. But who said, Lazarus, come forth? <laughs> Jesus. When you start talking about God's glory, you're always going to find Jesus because God put him in charge of it. That's my whole point in this. Now Jesus is discussing his impending death, troubled heart, talking to God, not for the deliverance from death. Think of these words. He says, Father, glorify your name. I'm praying, God, that you'll reveal yourself. Show the world who you are. Sensing to me that in the very act of his death, God was going to be revealed. Amen. And oh, how he was. Now the father responded to that prayer, got to believe that it was a good, appropriate prayer. And he responded quickly to that request, Father, glorify your name. God says, I have glorified it. I have revealed who I am in you. And it didn't stop there. He says, I'm going to reveal it again. When you die on that cross, the world will know who I am. Now Jesus had an insightful response. And he delineated right here and there at, on death's door what was going to take place. Now is the time for the judgment of this world. I will bear the judgment of this world. I will have the rejection of God in my death. And when you see me on the cross, you will know what God thinks of sin. Glory. 
You're going to know something about God. Jesus was the revealer of it. In John, the 12th chapter again, Jesus said, you know, when a man looks at me, he's got to see the one who sent me. I've come into the world as a light. I have come to display glory. I have come to reveal God. I'm coming into this world as a light. So if you believe in me, you won't stay in darkness. Jesus again speaking of his death, John 13th chapter. Now is the Son of Man glorified. This time, the Son of Man's going to be revealed. And God is glorified. God is going to be revealed in Jesus. Well, there's a direct fulfillment of the prophecy. If God is glorified, that is revealed in his Son, and he was, God will glorify, reveal the Son in himself. All right, John 14. The work of God has to be his glory. Can you imagine God doing some work that's not glorious? All of our work kind of reveal who we are. Here's Jesus. The Father living in me who is doing his work. <laughs> right in Jesus. I brought you glory on earth, he says in John the 17th. I, I, my words, I've revealed you on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. Amen. John, the 14th chapter again, the commands of God. Can you imagine a command of God not being glorious? They reveal his mind. They reveal his will. Jesus, the world must learn that I do exactly what the Father commands. There you are. I have obeyed my Father's commands. Now Jesus is explaining the work of the Holy Spirit that he's going to send after his departure. He said, now the Spirit's going to glorify, bring glory to me, said Jesus. In other words, the Spirit is going to reveal Jesus to us. But how, how's the Spirit going to do that? He said, he's going to take what belonged to Jesus. Okay. Now what belonged to Jesus? All that belongs to the Father is mine. And therefore, the uh, cycle is complete that it is God that's being glorified through Jesus and then the Holy Spirit part in this. Now, the, John 16, we've got another context here of Jesus going to the cross and the grave. Now, so you disciples, y'all going to weep? Y'all going to mourn? But that grief is going to turn to joy. Now, what did I tell you about joy a while ago? It is the, the legitimate response to a glory or to a revelation from God. So whatever was causing them to mourn, which was death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the death, burial, the death of Jesus caused them to mourn, that was going to reveal God's glory after the resurrection. So they would see Jesus again. How could this be? God showed them and showed the world what he thought of Jesus as he exerted his mighty power in resurrection. And he already shown the world what he thought. He's shown the world already what he thought of us. He crucified his son. That, that's what he thinks of us in the flesh. Now he's going to show us what he thinks of us in a resurrected Christ. So we could simply say, what's that man doing on the cross? The son of God. What's that man doing resurrecting? You're justified. And justification is a mighty glory of God. All because and demonstrated through Jesus. He is the one that's displaying the splendor of God. All right. Jesus was talking to God in the 17th chapter. John. I have revealed you to 
to those whom you gave me. And by definition, the revealing of God is glory. So that's a direct statement fulfilled. Isaiah 49, 3. I have made you known to them, and I'll continue to make you known for them, even in my death, especially my death, burial, and resurrection. So my point number one is Jesus certainly claimed to be fulfilling Isaiah 49, 3. Now the Acts assume it. Just take, we all love from my background, Acts 2. Note the familiar events and how the glory of God is on display. Apostles are filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's quite a revelation right there of God. <laughs> they got filled with it. Spoke in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Signs and wonders of God were declared, understood in many languages. Fulfillment of prophecies, Joel especially. Jesus of Nazareth, a man accredited by God by miracles, wonders, and signs. Here's where the glory comes. Which God did among you through Jesus. Servant to display the glory of God. Now, I know this is all glory because I know there had to be a lot of joy there, but even David got a kick out of this. I shouldn't use the word kick, but that's East Texas' word for joy. My heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. See, see, it just seen that prophetically. And when you got joy, it's always because you have a revelation from God, his glory. All right, Acts 3, Peter heal, healing a crippled beggar here. Yeah, well, remember the story. But what I have, I'll give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Walk! Now, when God heals, that's got to be glory. But it was Jesus' name that was invoked, and Peter explained it all. God glorified his servant, Jesus Christ, and he revealed his son. And why? Because the son had glorified the Father. That means the Son had revealed God to this earth. And what, what, what was the consequence of it? Well, there was a lot of praising of God going on there. Now, I'll tell you what, everybody's in for a praise deal. You don't have to ask people to praise God if they'll get a revelation from you. If you, if you, ever, if you can ever see God, you're going to praise Him, and you're going to be happy. Now, of interest to me was uh, Stephen in Acts 7th chapter. He starts out with a God of glory. He appeared to Abraham. <laughs> That's what glory is, is, is an appearing, it's a revelation. See, see, God, I used to, you know, kind of be mending the fence, and I'd think foolishly, I wonder if God ever just got desperate wondering how he's going to get himself known. Well, that was just accommodative for me. But God, he's, instead of using the word desperate, let me say, God really did want to be known to his creation. God wanted his glory, but how was he going to do it? In an unlimited way. He, of course, did it through Jesus. Here he does it in a limited way. According to Stephen, God of glory appeared to Abraham. Now, I'm sure Abraham didn't see near as much of God as we can see in Jesus. But that's quite okay. He starts out here. And the Jews like that. Now, they're all disturbed with him, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't get a few amens uh, in the first part of his sermon here. But mood shifted pretty quick. As Stephen was revealing God, that, that is his glory, he's showing the mind of God, he, because he's quoting from Amos and quoting from Isaiah, God's words. Then he accused them of being stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears. Here's the way 
I would explain that. What he is saying in my words, he said, y'all don't know nothing about God's glory. That's what, that's what it amounted to. Well, he said, well, you betrayed and murdered the righteous one. And the prophets predicted you would. Now, I'm going to tell you what. If you don't receive a revelation, if you don't know God, you'll pull the same stunts. So we don't be too hard on them. If, if, if we don't want to know God, we're, we can be perfectly capable of murdering the Son of God. Well, their rage and fury knew no bounds, so they just stoned him. Now, now here's an interesting point that I want to get to. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked to heaven, and it opened for him. And he saw the glory of God. He saw something. And what did he see? Jesus at the right hand. Now, he saw something there. Now, I told you, the legitimate response to glory is what? Joy. Now, here's a man being stoned to death. And he was happy. He was happy. Even to the point that, God, don't charge this to me. That's seeing God's glory. And it'll work for us, too. It will. Amen. If you can see your Savior at the right hand of God and know why he's there, you can die in peace if you're being stoned to death. And I assume any other reason. Philip in Samaria was proclaiming Christ, you know. The glory of God was on display healings, evil spirits cast out, crippled. Now, now, no glory was being revealed. God was being revealed because it says there was great joy there. <laughs> and they wasn't rebuked about it either. Now, eunuch, he's reading about the suffering servant of God. Philip declared the good news of Jesus to him. The eunuch was baptized. You remember all this story. He went on his way rejoicing. He'd seen God. Responsive glory. Now Paul give a long sermon in Acts 13th chapter. Antioch, the city in Antioch. Just a little summation here. He said, God brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. John testified of him. Testified, that's revealing. God brought, that's revealing. Jesus was sentenced to death, executed on the cross. God raised him. God promised, and he has fulfilled his promises. And he had fulfilled that his servant will show his glory through Jesus. So he quotes Isaiah, quotes Isaiah 49 and 6, which I read to you a while ago. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were happy glad and joyous. Amen. So I know they had seen the glory of God or they had begun to know God. Now Paul's defense to Agrippa, Paul told Agrippa what Jesus had told him. Paul, I'm Jesus. Now I'm appearing to you. So I'm displaying some glory here. As a witness to what you've seen of me, Seen, that's uh, revealing. And what I will show you, more revelation. Now you're going to in turn, you're going to open eyes, you're going to let people see God. And then you're going to turn people from darkness, turn them to the light. You're going to turn people from Satan, you're going to turn them to God, that's what the light is for. All in order for forgiveness in a place among the sanctified. Now the Moses and the prophets said this would happen, i.e. that Jesus would proclaim light to his people and to the Gentiles. Therefore, the book of Acts, many other places in it, 
confirms it. Now, my last point, and I'll be through. The epistles teach it. Can't go into but just a very few examples, but Romans 1, I, I, it's hard to get out of it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul says. That's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed. I say, I'll declare it. I'll preach it. I'll reveal it. Revealing God's good news is his glory. What about this gospel, Paul? It's God's power. Ah, that reveals something about God. I know his power for he created this earth. No, this is the power unto salvation. The power of God is his glory. For in the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed. That's glory. God's righteousness is his glory. And it's in the gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection. You can't get Jesus away from God's glory. If God is going to show you himself, Jesus is going to be right between him and you. I don't know where it leads everybody else, but I'm telling you what the scripture says. Well, I know where it leads them, but I don't even think about it. Paul follows this up with a staggering text in the third chapter. Just a few points. A righteousness from God has been made known. There's glory revealed. The prophets testified of it. That's a re revelation of it. Not as good as we have. From God, the prophets testified it, but how does it come? It comes from God through faith in Jesus. <laughs> you cannot get him out. Now, why was this needed? For all had fallen short of the glory, which simply means the world did not know God until they could see what God did through Jesus for us. The world cannot know God. That's the reason you fall short of the glory of God. You didn't understand God until you could see what Jesus did for us. Now God, thus God presented Jesus, revealed his glory, as a sacrifice of atonement, and why was this important to God? God did this to demonstrate that is revealing his glory. God did this, offer Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement to reveal his justice. I will not look over your sin. I will have my justice. And why did he want to reveal his justice? in the blood of Jesus Christ, so as to be just while he was setting us free or justifying us. All of this, of course, is a demonstration of the glory of God all through uh, uh, Jesus. After first further delineation in Romans, the fifth chapter, Paul reaches his therefore because of what comes before. Therefore, we, in light of all of this, have peace and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Punctuates this chain of thought when he said, God demonstrated, he showed us, he revealed it to us, his love for us, and how, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, you obviously know that as you get into Corinthians, Ephesians, especially in other places, these kinds of things are over and over presented. As Paul told the Corinthians, he's the Lord of glory because he's in charge of it. And uh, he said, otherwise, no, I can see. You can't see God without the Lord of glory, Jesus Christ. You can't hear God without the Lord of glory, Jesus Christ. Your mind can't conceive without the Lord of glory. But God has revealed it. Here said, yes, by his spirit, but the spirit didn't have a separate agenda of his own. He was only sent by Jesus to confirm all that Jesus did. 
So it all reverts back to Jesus. No matter how many promises God has made, that's his glory. When God makes a promise, that's glorious, I'll assure you. They are confirmed, yes, in Jesus, fulfilled in Jesus. And through Jesus, the amen is spoken to us. Oh, that's exciting when you can just sit back there and say amen. To the glory of God, to the revelation of God himself. It's like the more you see. These things just seem to go in a cycle like the more you see of God, the more he reveals to you. And the more joyous you are and the more he'll reveal to you in and your joy just gets bigger and bigger as he reveals to you. More and more. Well, well, we've got a big God. It's going to take him an eternity to get it all over to you. So, uh, but, but you've got an eternity if you want the glory of God. Uh, I'll uh, one more here. It's, I, 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 don't, I don't need to comment on this text. It's too powerful. It, it, I, I detract from it. A few highlights in Second Corinthians. The law come with glory. <laughs> Why wouldn't it? It's revealing God's mind. That's what glory is, is a revelation who God is. It's revealing. Where do you think the law come from? <laughs> he didn't get it from a neighbor. It come from his mind. But, but, but that glory of the revelation of God's mind, the people couldn't assemble it. They, they, they couldn't take it on. They're, they couldn't digest it. They, they, they had a veil over their hearts. Well, you know, I used to be critical of them. <laughs> I couldn't assemble it either. Don't be too critical of the Jews rejecting the law, that veil over their hearts. Uh, it condemned them. Why would you want to be excited about it? Uh, well, but the ministry that brings righteousness is more glory because it sets you free. It's not condemning. Revealing more glory because it does set us free. And we, glimpsing at this freedom, unveil our hearts more and more, reflecting the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with every increasing glory which I've been talking about. So as you see Jesus and thus God, God gives you more and more of himself or more and more of his revelation. So Paul says, we, we preach, that's revealing Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Lord of glory mainly. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made this light glory to shine in our hearts. Why? To give us the light, that's glory, of the knowledge of the glory of Jesus. And how? In the face of Jesus. Now, I'll leave you with these words. My coin has got these two sides, grace and truth, mercy and justice, whatever words you want to use. doesn't make God double-minded. It is one coin. They are but expressions of God's glory fulfilled in Christ. If it's one coin, there must be one word that would unite truth and grace, justice and mercy. And that unifying word is love. God is love. But I wouldn't know that except for Jesus. Love is God's essence or divine nature. Jesus is the expression of this love, for God unconditionally ascribed worth to the worthless at great cost to himself through Jesus. He didn't just send a book. He didn't even send an angel to die. You were worth more than that to God. So he came himself. He didn't stay long. 
but he stayed long enough. And as he closed the book of the Bible, he says, I am the bright morning star. Just another way.